right, if you're ready to start, um, good morning. Thank you for joining Historic Dumfries, Virginia as we host our Members First program. Our nonprofit organization offers this as a thank you to our members every other month and we theme it around local history. Today, I'm very excited to introduce Wash Schwalm. Ross has been a resident of Woodbridge since 1993 and holds BAs in political science and history from Rosinus College in Pennsylvania and an MS in education from Old Dominion University. He is a 20 year retired officer, Desert Storm combat veteran of the US Marine Corps and worked 20 years as a contractor supporting the Department of Defense. He currently leads three history and genealogy based nonprofits in his spare time and his focus is putting himself in the footsteps of his many ancestors from the revolution to the modern wars. He has published in the Marine Corps Gazette, the Hessians, the Journal of the Johannes Schwalm Historical Association, and online with the Irish Brigade Camp Number no. 4, Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War. He loves to speak publicly and has done so to crowds of two to 2,000. He is currently president of the Johannes Schwalm Historical Association and the Sons of the American Revolution, Colonel William Grayson chapter. Thank you so much. And I will now turn the Zoom over to him. Very good. Um, do I have to share again? Um, no, we should be, everyone should be able to see your screen. Okay, cool. Thank you. <clears throat> well, this is a, a interesting subject. Um, I had uh, driven through Dumfries about 500 times over the last uh, 20 years or thereabouts and uh, just about every day going to work. And I took a tour with um, a historic Prince William and uh, they mentioned, they had one mention of the Hessian prisoners in Dumfries. And uh, I explained to them that, that I'm kind of the guy that does that. And uh, that was in 2019, I think. And um, so it was time for me to fast forward my, my timeline and, and execute you know, one of the one of the many projects I had on my mind. So <clears throat> what you're seeing on the screen is, is actually a map of Dumfries created by one of the prisoners. And we'll talk quite a bit about him today. <clears throat> Lisa told you kind of, you know, a little bit about my history, but but who I really am is uh, what I like to call descendant full disclosure. So I am a Hessian. Uh, my third great grandfather was a prisoner of war captured at Trenton, um, Johannes Schwamm. And he was part of the Niedpausen Regiment in 1770. That was one of the three regiments that, that were partially captured at, at Trenton. Uh, he came to America in uh, 1776. He fought in New York and New Jersey. Um, I call that, that section of his life uh, Hessians Victorious. And then, of course, he was captured, uh, sent to Lancaster as a POW. And, um, but most of his officers that he would have served with actually ended up in Dumfries. Um, he was captured a second time and ended up spending four years in Philadelphia as a prisoner. But after the war ended, he made his home in Pennsylvania and um, you know, had a, a son and two daughters. And that son had 15 children and were still farming or fighting in the military. Um, for the last uh, 245 years. Um, I'm also a militiaman. My fourth great grandfather, John Adam Lebo, was uh, uh, served in two months in the Pennsylvania militia in 1779. And he's a first generation American. His father emigrated from, uh, from Germany. You know, sometimes that, that, that part of Germany is called France. Uh, so he lived along the Rhine River. And uh, uh, they were Protestants. And uh, when the Catholics took charge of France, uh, they felt like they needed to go somewhere else where they could practice their religion. And uh, they ended up in America. Um, and his descendants, I've been able to track down, uh, uh, fought in the War of 1812, in Baltimore in, in 1814, which is uh, where the Star Spangled Banner was written. Um, so they had Civil War veterans, World War II, and, and of course, in my case, the Gulf War. So a little bit about this project. Uh, here, here's the outline we'll follow today. I'll give you a background on it. 
uh, let you know the questions we were trying to answer and, and, and the responses to those questions. Uh, a little piece on who were the Hessians. Uh, a lot of people don't really know who they were. And uh, so I'll give you a little bit of that. Um, and then the march to Dumfries, you know, the Battle of Trenton, and then how we got to Dumfries. How did these prisoners end up there? Uh, what was their experience while they were in Dumfries? And then, you know, how did their imprisonment actually end? Which is sort of a kind of abrupt ending to, to what was a pretty good life for them. Um, then we'll talk a little bit of what happened to them afterwards. You know, what they were, they were exchanged or they, some of them had passed away. And a little, just a little bit of statistical analysis and then a, a summary. <clears throat> so JSHA has been you know, researching and publishing on, on Hessians uh, since uh, 1975. Uh, we did do a little bit of work on the Hessian prisoners in Dumfries back in uh, the mid eighties. Um, and you know, this is a niche among a niche, right? This is a really small set of, of uh, people. Um, and there was some coverage on it, but I, I felt like, you know, we needed to kind of consolidate all of this and put it together, um, you know, do a comprehensive review. And, you know, to help both JSHA, uh, Historic Dumfries, right? And, and Historic Prince William, you know, as well as the, the county's history division. So, uh, and this was all at, at, in my plan uh, to do next year. And I just had to fast forward it uh, when, I, when I took that tour in the summer of uh, 2019. So I, I got myself a little, an intern from Florida uh, named George Kotlick, and he uh, was a graduate student in history. And um, we were able to um, work on a, a, a grant with um, historic Prince William and I, I ended up being the academic advisor. We also had a researcher in Germany. Uh, he's a JSHA volunteer and he lives in uh, Marburg. So that was convenient because he could get to uh, the Marburg archives and, and hunt down some of the genealogy information on, on these uh, 49 individuals. Um, I also got a lot of help out of my Revolutionary War Military Research Committee. You know, they, they pointed me in the right direction and I was able to help help George, you know, put all that together. Uh, and we, the project ran from January of 20 until 21. And, um, you know, we were blocked a little bit by COVID. There's some, there's some papers in, in the Maryland Historical Society that we couldn't get to. Uh, so this, as, as we know in history, sometimes projects are never quite done. And uh, so we can continue on with this. Um, and we actually did with, with some research here. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. <clears throat> so since January of 21, um, I was able to do some field research along US-1 to find uh, the Hessian POW camp that's mentioned in the Hessian diary. It also happened to be kind of marked on um, a map uh, that, that is produced by uh, historic Prince William. They have it on their website of all things. And it says right on there, here's a Hessian prisoner camp. So I actually went out there, took photos of it, tried to figure out the most likely spot where this, this place was. And um, the, the, the prisoners, there were only four of them, and they were only there for like four days. So you talk about a niche of a niche of a niche, that, that, that's one of them. Um, so we published the, the full article in the um, Prince William you know, History Volume 3. Uh, you can purchase that from... Uh, right up the street there at Williams Ordinary, you can go buy one for $5. And the, it, a pretty large paper is in there, the Dumfries map that was on the first slide, was, they were able to print it in there in their, in their format. Uh, so there were some, some updates to the original paper that were done for that, that uh, publication. And then the third version of the story I, I just published, uh, we just released it in August of 21. And um, it covers uh, some of the things we did not cover in, in either the paper in detail or, or in the article we gave to um, uh, his Prince, the Prince William County History Division. Um, so our plan going forward is to do profiles. I plan on doing one regiment, you know, which it amounts to be about somewhere between 10, 15 soldiers or officers for each regiment. And then 
we'll publish one of those regiments each year over the next couple of years just to keep interest going on, on this particular story. <clears throat> so with any good project, you know, I, I, I put the challenge to George on, on okay, here, here's a set of questions we need to answer, right? Mm -hmm. this, this is really what we want to know. And um, which is cool, um, you know, how did these soldiers get to America? You know, where did they serve in combat, you know, before Trenton? You know, how were they actually transported to Dumfries? And that, that was a lot of fun trying to figure that out. Um, you know, and where did they live while they were in Dumfries? And then did they establish any relationships with local residents and uh, like happened at other prisoner locations? And so we, we, we assumed that that was the case because it happened elsewhere. And then how were they paid, right? I mean, these, these guys were still given their pay, even though they were prisoners of war. Well, how did that actually happen? And then, you know, did they have any jobs in the local community? A couple other questions, you know, like what happened to them after they, they left Dumfries and, and, you know, they moved to Winchester, Virginia, but what happened to them after that? And so we didn't answer that yet. Um, and if they returned to Germany, what were their lives like? So this is two questions that we're going to look at um, as we go forward. Uh, we, we weren't able to um, nail that down in, in the first paper uh, or since. So we still have some open questions. Um, and then did any of them stay in the United States or Canada? And that's a big question because that those people, if they had any descendants would be you know, ripe for joining my, my JSHA organization. And did any of them actually desert in Virginia? In other words, did they actually stay here um, and uh, make their lives after the war? So pretty pretty good set of questions. Um, we did we did look at another aspect of it. Did the troops marry any local Prince William County women? And the answer to that is no. We we found no evidence that they they married anyone while they were here, and of course they were only here for a few months. So. And then was, was anything published in newspapers about this prisoner? And so it was kind of like, that would be sort of tipping your hands to the British because the British read our newspapers, right? Um, and so we only found two references uh, about newspapers and uh, we, there may be others, but we just couldn't get access to those. Like not everything's been digitized, right? So there's a little bit of a, an issue. <clears throat> So I always like to tell folks, you know, what uh, what sources I used, because um, you'll you'll see those. Our primary source was really the, uh, the Hessian, uh, the Trenton prisoner list. In other words, we my organization has um, compiled that list to figure out who were the approximate thousand prisoners, what were their names, what were the units, what kind of jobs did they have, uh, and then there was an update to this list uh, in 2013. Um, so we used we started with that list, and um, and that's how we created. Okay, which which of the prisoners were actually sent to Dumfries? And there there's an indicator for that in in the list in the in the uh, the data that we have. Now, <clears throat> one of our former board members, uh, Bruce Burgoyne, was um, you know he wrote significant amounts on Hessians, and he one of the things he did was he translated two diaries and put them into one book called Defeat, Disaster, and Dedication. And it was uh, Jacob Peel and uh, Andreas Wiederholt. And uh, so that, that book exists. Um, you know, I purchased it and, and, you know, George and I were able to use that to call out, you know, various aspects of what was going on. Uh, also, the, the paymaster of, for all of these prisoners, both in Lancaster and in, and in Dumfries, um, he discussed two journeys to pay these, these prisoners. And of course, we published that, uh, translated it, published it back in uh, 2005 with JSHA. So that was, it's a primary source because, you know, this is right directly from an individual that was, was part of it. Um, we used, and you can see some of the other references uh, that, that we've also used. Uh, Ken Jones was, was the big writer of the the people that were in Dumfries, he, he took an interest on Carl Friedrich Fuhrer, you know, prisoner, patriot, publisher, and he published two stories on him. And then, uh, and those are available, that, those two journals are available at, at Dumfries Library there. So Lisa can help you, you know, find those if you're interested in reading those. 
And then Daniel Krebs, he's a, a friend of JSHA. He's written for us. Um, he, uh, he wrote a great book on Germans and the merciful enemy, a generous and merciful enemy. And this is all about prisoners of war in the American Revolution, all the, the Hessian prisoners. And um, he has actually come and spoken uh, in Washington, D.C. and, and to uh, my organization up in Pennsylvania. So he's, he's still a friend of, of ours. And uh, he just finished a year at the Army War College in Carlisle. Uh, so he's heading back to Louisville here uh, for the, this academic year. <clears throat> Wienerholtz's diary has actually been, you know, digitized by the University of Pennsylvania. And um, this image here explains, you know, what they did, you know, what this diary was all about, and, you know, where they found it in the, in the archives. And this is actually the back cover of our uh, 2021 journal. Um, and, you know, I put the link on there if anybody, you know, you can go look at this. So one of the fascinating things about his diary is that, you know, his original drawings are in there. He's, he drew a ship uh, that my third great grandfather was on and was captured on. And, uh, so it's really kind of cool. It, 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 he has a picture of the ship before it went to sea and then a picture of it when it was hauled back into Philadelphia after it had been damaged and, and these prisoners were captured again. So that's kind of, that's a whole nother uh, story on the Triton, the ship Triton that I, that I work on. Okay, who, who were the Hessians? You know, the Hessians basically, to Americans, were basically anybody that came from Germany that uh, actually, you know, fought in the revolution. And so they categorized them in one big pile and they just called them all Hessians. Well, why did they do that? Well, because the Hessians, the, the state of Hesse uh, in Germany actually gave the most troops. And so they, they ended up uh, just assuming that they were all Hessians. And that's not really the case, as you will see. Um, <clears throat> so another great book to give you, uh, you know, insight on, on some of this is uh, Rick Atkins' first book on his trilogy, The British Are Coming. And, and I like to look at it from the other perspective. And in other words, and they need their Hessian auxiliaries. In other words, they, they, the British to this day do not have a large standing army. Um, nor did the United States up until uh, post World War II. Uh, we did not, you know, have a large start standing army. We were more like the British, but they they realized that this was a uh, King George needed a whole bunch more troops because you know for every kind of duty you can imagine, defensive operations, offensive operations. There's actually a group of Hessians that went to Gibraltar uh, and guarded that, and that released a British regiment to come to America and uh, try to put down a rebellion. But as early as uh, September of 74, uh, Prime Minister Lord North said, you know, Hessians and Hanno Hanoverians could be employed if necessary. So they knew pretty early on they were gonna need help uh, with putting down the rebellion. Uh, <clears throat> so if you fast forward a little bit to uh, April of 1775, you know, you'll understand that you know, that was Lexington and Concord and the British, you know, had significant losses and they had to retreat back into Boston. And so they, they were holed up in Boston and, and General Gage, you know, sent a letter to Lord Barrington. Uh, and he made a pretty good assessment of, of what was going on. He knew he, he was going to need a lot more troops. And he, he basically is quoted as... Um, Things have now come to the crisis that we must avail ourselves of every resource, even raise the Negroes in our cause. Hanoverians, Hessians, perhaps Russians may be hired. So he kind of was suggesting to, to the government of Britain, you know, what he needed to do. He also said, I think I need about 32,000 troops to put down the rebellion, and uh, which is sort of interesting. Um, uh, you'll see this again later um, as you discuss the numbers of actual Hessians that came here. Um, so shortly thereafter, you know, June 17th was the Battle of Reeds Hill and Bunker Hill, right? This is when the, the British were forced to evacuate Boston um, because they, they, you know, the Continentals took the high ground. Um, so when they started looking for troops, um, the Russians initially turned down the offer and, and 
we have indicators that Catherine the Great was thinking that, well, if her Russians go all the way to North America, they're probably never coming back. You know, they'll probably desert. And uh, so she didn't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, Frederick the Great from Prussia also turned down the offer because he's still licking his wounds from uh, the, the Seven Years' War and as the French and Indian War in America. So it was, it fell down to the, the Hessian principalities that were in, um, in Hesse. And, um, you know, so er negotiations for these treaties started as early as uh, 1776 to get more troops. <clears throat> so the, the Hessians, basically they served under what were called subsidy treaties. Um, in other words, the, the, the British government would pay a subsidy to the prince and then the prince was responsible to arm the troops, get the number of troops he needed, and uh, you know equip them in order for for service, you know, with in North America. And um, so most of the these enlistees, basically the ones that joined to, to fill out the ranks, um, and, and all the units themselves, as whole units, they were marched. They left the, you know Germany and the German states and marched to a port of embarkation. And once they got to that port of embarkation, they would have to swear an oath to, to King George III uh, in order to, um, you know, because there's a monarchy, they're going to support the combat. So they're basically getting orders from, from the British, you know, high command uh, to do that. Um, and these states were, were loosely put together as the Holy Roman Empire, if you remember your Western European history. Um, Anyway, they could shipped off to America. So where is Hesse? Um, so Hesse is right in the middle of Germany, um, as you can see. And uh, what that means is they suffered from invasions from both the East and the West. And, uh, and this, this played into um, the, the Prince of Hesse, uh, how he decided to lay out some fortresses. And it was kind of interesting if you've ever been over there that, that is right smack dab in the middle of Germany. And um, um, a lot of people go north and south as well as east, west uh, through there. <clears throat> so very early on, um, the prince decided that he, his main capital was Kassel. And he, he built a fort there. And then to, to stop the French from messing with him, he put another fortress in Marburg. And so, you know, Marburg is still a um, very famous city in Germany, and so it's Castle. And then in the middle, he decided that he needed a fallback position, that if, if the French attacked, you know, where would, I, where would my troops fall back to if, if Marburg was, was under siege or if we had to evacuate Marburg? Where, where would we go? And the same was true if they got invaded from, from the east, you know, by the Prussians or by, uh, you know, by other, you know, infidels coming from that direction, where would they fall back to? So they picked a site uh, in, called Ziegenheim, Ziegenheim, and um, it was really built as a fallback position. Now, what's interesting, it's called the water fortress, and the moat that fills the water fortress is called the Schwalm River, and it, this is the Schwalm Valley, and um, so it's kind of interesting, the Ziegenheim is now part of a larger city. Uh, it's two villages were merged together for administrative purposes. It's now called Schwalmstadt or Schwalm City. So kind of an interesting uh, tie to my last name. <clears throat> so here's a model of the water fortress uh, Ziegenheim. It's kind of interesting. Each of the four walls are a different length and a different angle. Um, and then of course the moat is, um, is, is also slightly different and and that was you know really for defensive purposes and you can see to the to the north or to the top of the photo you see a, a field uh that also has a, a fence around it well this is where the the fortress would grow some of its food and and um, you know they wanted to protect that from from other farmers and other you know, people that would come there the moat was also set up in a way by the engineers that they could flood these valleys in case there was an invasion and um, which would then make it a lot harder to attack a fort. Um, the French occupied this fortress in uh, uh, the Seven Years' War, and they were stupid enough to uh, flood the plain 
and then that caused all kind of other problems for them. So uh, uh, just as an example of, of, you know, be careful what you ask for, you might not get it. And, uh, <clears throat> so here's a little um, uh, model of the Fortress Ziegenheim. And it was, uh, you know, what I'll call a full service, uh, full service fortress. Um, they had a castle, it's called the Schloss, and the troops stayed there on, the, you can see that over here on the left of the, of the uh, thing. That's where the, the troops stayed. And then the officers stayed in this, this other building right here. Um, and then, of course, they were uh, very religious. Um, the motto of the German army is God mit uns, which is God with us. And it, that was their motto up until the end of uh, World War II. So this church right here has a steeple on the top of it. And uh, this is a parade plot or parade, parade ground right in the middle. And this is where the troops trained. And then there, there was an archives building, right? He, uh, the, the prince said, I want a, a secure place for my archives. The walls of this building are three feet thick and, and the door is this massive wooden door. And, and today it's a winery. I mean, a wine, a wine uh, restaurant. So it's kind of cool, you can go there. And then the, the eating facility is right here. And this is now the um, Museum of the Schwalm. You know, that's the whole Schwalm Valley has their own museum inside the fortress now. And then there's a corn house here, corn house, as we'd say in, in, in German. But this is actually a grain house. So they'd stored all their grain that they would need, you know, to make bread and, and, and uh, you know, that sort of thing inside the fortress. So it's kind of neat to have that, that picture. Um, of the fortress itself. Now, if, you're, if your name happens to be Schwalm and, and you're in the Schwalm Valley and your descendant actually marched on this parade ground, um, there's certain things you have to do. Like I, uh, they opened up the door behind the big pipe organ uh, in, inside the church and they go, Ross, we, we want to show you something. And so they, they made my wife and I crawl up through the belfry and uh, there's actually a, a platform all around the, the top of the building. And um, so I, I, I took this picture of, of the parade plots uh, where my you know, third great grandfather actually trained to be, be a soldier. So it's kind of neat that this, this facility is still here. There was another regiment that served in here uh, called the Regiment Von Hoon. And uh, they, actually, they were a garrison regiment, but they got shipped to America as well. And I'm part of their uh, reenactment unit. By the way, the bells work really well. We were there for confirmation Sunday. And when the children were confirmed and the bells rang for about 20 minutes um, to celebrate, you know, these, these children joining the church. So to give you an idea of how these uh, uh, soldiers, and these regiments got to, got to America, I did a, a little piece here on the footsteps of the regiment von Diephausen. So this is actually my third great grandfather and the steps he would have taken. So basically they left in March of 76, uh, um, from Ziegenheim, they marched 223 miles to Kassel. Um, they got to uh, about a month, just about a whole month of March, they got to Bremelay, and uh, that's where they swore their allegiance. And then they embarked on the ship to Claudia uh, for their trip over to England to uh, marry up with all the rest of the invasion force. And then they came, they came to America. So this is what it would look like on the ground. Um, I, I plotted this out and you can actually drive this route uh, today. You know, it's kind of cool. But what's interesting is there's a little yellow star down here in the bottom of the map. And that is where um, Johannes was actually, his hometown is right there in Willenshausen. And um, I got to meet the mayor of Willenshausen and uh, big uh, six foot seven, you know, German, but broke my hand when I shook his hand, but uh, really, really uh, a nice politician. So they get to America, they landed on uh, Staten Island. Uh, they, they participated in the invasion of uh, Long Island, largest amphibious assault uh, ever done up to that point in history, about 15,000 people. Um, I, do a, I do a talk on that if you're ever interested. Um, they also fought the Battle of uh, White Plains, the Battle of Fort Washington. And after they took Fort Washington, they renamed it to uh, Fort Neuhausen, of all things, after their general. Um, so they, they chased the Continentals all the way down through New Jersey and the Hessians were put basically what would, would have been considered the, the most forward outpost um, 
in Trenton. So there were about 1,500 Hessians in, in Trenton uh, in the winter of 1776, and they were going to uh, winter over there. It was essentially a defensive force of about three regiments and, and artillery. Uh, so it was a, a pretty defensive, uh, pretty good outfit to be there. And they, you know, to keep an eye on what's going across the river, right, in, in Pennsylvania. Well, Washington, as you know, surprised them with, uh, he crossed the, the frozen Delaware with about 2,400 Americans. And they, you know, they won the Battle of Trenton. And uh, they captured about 1,000 of those 1,500. And of those, there were 49 that actually were sent to Dumfries. So uh, again, this is a small niche of niches, right? Uh, of, you know, how do you call out these, these people, you know, these, these small set of people? Um, you know, but, but, you know, success sometimes does have its problems, right? The first issue that, that the Continentals had was we got to get these guys back across the river. And uh, unfortunately, uh, some, of the, some of the Continentals found the, the rum supply of, of the Hessians and uh, got, got a little, drank a little bit too much. And then they, they had to row back across the Delaware while they were uh, slightly inebriated. Uh, but anyway, the first stop along this trip uh, was in Newtown, Pennsylvania for the officers. And this is, they were separated out. They separated the officers from the enlisted men and uh, from the, the soldiers. And there were 27 officers that were captured and um, they were separated out. So on the 28th, uh, they all had dinner with General Washington. I mean, this is a gentlemanly war um, you know, that, that happens. And, you know, Lieutenant Peel and, and Lieutenant Wiederholt both mentioned in their diaries about, about Washington and their insights on, on Washington. And they go, he doesn't look like, uh, he doesn't smile much. And he's, you know, doesn't look like he would be the kind of guy that could, you know, lead a whole nation. Uh, that was just their assessment of it. But Wiederholt struck up enough of a conversation with, with Washington to, uh, convince him of something that, that is very, very important to, to the history of the war. Um, <clears throat> on December 31st, they were marched down to Philadelphia. And uh, if, if you study any of that, the troops, you know, this was a big, big show. They wanted to show marching the, the prisoners through Philadelphia. And of course, the, the, the city of brotherly love was not too brotherly uh, or loving to, uh, to these Hessians. And, um, um, now the, the officers were in, in a wagon, a covered wagon, so they didn't, they didn't, were not subjected to the horse manure and everything else, rotten vegetables that were thrown at the, at the enlisted men. Um, but on January 1st to the 5th, most of the Hessian soldiers with only one officer were marched to uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, and that was where the other 26 officers were then called out uh, for sent, sent to Dumfries. <clears throat> so here's the, here's the route they took to get to uh, Dumfries. It was uh, 26 officers and uh, 23 of their enlisted servants that, so for a total of 49, um, were, were sent um, on a trip down to Baltimore. So they left Philadelphia, they crossed the Schuylkill River, they stopped in Chester, PA. And so that was a, a route of about 18 miles. Then they marched to, uh, from Chester to Wilmington and then to the head of the Elk in Maryland, right? Elkton, Maryland, is, as it was called today. Um, and then they, they went to Charlestown after that and stayed two nights because the, the uh, Susquehanna River was frozen um, and they, they weren't sure how to get across. Um, and then, then they moved to um, Bushtown, which is in modern day Abington near the Bush River um, in Maryland. And then they finally arrived in Baltimore. They, they kind of staggered into Baltimore uh, over the course of three days. And, and you wonder, well, well, why were they in Baltimore? And um, well, it's interesting, the Continental Congress actually uh, decided that they better move out of Philadelphia. And they actually moved to Baltimore uh, for a short period of time. And one of the things we tried to figure out was why did the Continental Congress decide to move the prisoners further south? Why didn't they leave them in, in Baltimore? Um, and uh, a couple of reasons. So the italicized text you see there is sort of 
what we've been able to assess. Now, I can't prove any of this, but, um, but we're thinking that they wanted to move the officers further away from Lancaster, right? Most of the troops were in Lancaster. And if you separated the, the men, then they couldn't influence them and whatever. Um, again, the British forces in New Jersey, so this put the officers even further away um, from that. Um, they could potentially want to exchange the officers at some point for, for Continental officers. And so it made sense to, to separate them out. And, and again, they left one officer in Lancaster and all the rest were, were brought to uh, Dumfries. So this was a way to keep them consolidated in a single place. Um, and, and quite frankly, Virginia was sort of one of the more wealthy states and, and Dumfries was convenient because you know, it, it had access to a river. Um, it had, uh, there were some empty houses there um, you know, because of the shipping industry was shut down. Um, and what, one of the facts we were able to find that Pennsylvania said, hey, don't give us any more prisoners. We can't even, you know, we can't even take care of the ones we have now. So this is a time in the war early on that that uh, you know the states were still responsible for matters you know inside their own states, and so if the Continental Congress said, "Okay, you're getting these prisoners," they just assumed that the state would have the money to take care of them. And this this was not necessarily the case. Um, so, but on January fifteenth, the Continental Congress uh, allocated five hundred and thirty three you know, shillings probably or dollars to defray the cost of transport to Dumfries. Um, and what George and I were able to figure out is because they probably rented some wagons to help move these guys. But for the most part, they walked, um, even though they were officers. So they, they headed out uh, on January 18th to uh, Elkridge, Maryland, and uh, then down to the Quaker Iron Works. Uh, they went to uh, Plattensburg, and this would have been sort of familiar to uh, to the Germans, right? Because Plattensburg is actually a German name, which is today Bladensburg, right? Um, and they went to Georgetown, Maryland, and then uh, crossed over the Potomac into Alexandria. Uh, and then from Alexandria, they, they, they were trying to get down to uh, Dumfries, and they took a wrong turn somewhere in the woods, and they ended up marching, uh, you know, 17 miles. They ended up in Colchester, which is... Uh, uh, I believe just just north of the uh, Occoquan, somewhere up and around there, and then uh, they have finally arrived in Dumfries on January 24th. And you can see there the distances of these guys. So this is reasonable that they would have been able to walk walk this distance um, on these days. Um, it was not not that big of a deal. Um, <clears throat> now overall, the the Hessian prisoners were were pretty well treated by, you know, in comparison to the English allies. So the, there were some British prisoners in Lancaster um, before, before the Hessians got there and they were actually locked up in the jail. They were guarded. They had very few um, liberties to go, go in town and, and do anything. But when the Hessians got there, that was, was not the case at all, right? There were a lot of German Americans already in, in the Lancaster area. And they were given liberties to roam around town and uh, into the surrounding countryside. Um, many of them were hired out, um, and you know they took jobs to earn extra money. And uh, my third great grandfather actually worked for a local farmer. And then about once a week, he had to check back into the Lancaster him and his his friend that he was with. Uh, but for the rest of the time, they lived with the with, lived with the local farmer and. Uh, you know, helped him farm his farm because guess what? All the other young men were in the Continental Army. So, and, and they were treated, you know, with civility. So this is the same thing that they wrote about in Dumfries. Um, same kind of thing. They had plenty, you know, plenty of liberty. Uh, they could start their own little job or own little economy as they called it um, and, and trade with each other or, or you know, sell things to, to the locals. Um, and they were basically treated by civility. The people in charge in Dumfries of these prisoners to keep an eye on them was the Committee of Public Safety. Right? And as some of you may remember, the Committee of Public Safety, the head of that was Colonel William Grayson. Um, he had served some time with Washington as uh, an aide-de-camp, and then Washington sent him back to Virginia to, to form a regiment. 
And uh, so while he was he was basically in the Dumfries area, keeping an eye on the prisoners, while at the same time he was recruiting to fill out the what became the Fifth Virginia Regiment. So he kind of struck up a relationship with uh, with one or two of the officers, and um, so it's kind of interesting. They treated each other as as uh, equals. You know, it's just unfortunate circumstances. War, one gets captured and one does not. So Andreas Wiederholt uh, was, you know, educated and he kept a diary. But unfortunately, when he was captured, his his knapsack or with with all of his diaries in it was was left in Trenton. And so he actually asked Washington if he could go back to Trenton and recover these items. And Washington agreed to this. And so he made two trips across the the Delaware River to go and, and retrieve his papers. And he did find them, which is kind of a, a godsend to all of us that are historians to know that that his pre-war, pre-capture information, were, you know, he was able to get that. Um, so he, he was also a, a bit of an artist and a photographer. And uh, you, you saw one of his maps that he drew, I'll show to you again. Um, and he basically rented a room um, you know, it had one bed in it. It was about a mile from uh, Dumfries. And, um, you know, he was highly respected by the other officers in Dumfries. And he was picked to travel to go to Lancaster to go collect their pay from, from uh, the quartermaster, a guy named Lieutenant Mueller. Um, so this is interesting. They, the Committee of Public Safety obviously officer, gave him a horse and off he went to, uh, to Lancaster to find, to find the pay. And, uh, <clears throat> which is interesting. I, I, uh, I published this in the JSHA uh, uh, document, but he basically left February 5th. Um, it was about a 160 mile trip from Dumfries to Lancaster. Um, I kind of do this quite often, you know, myself today. Uh, it takes me about three hours. And, uh, but he, he went over the Occoquan, up over the Bull Run, uh, you know, around Leesburg, uh, over the Potomac, you know, through Frederick. Of course, Frederick is named after Frederick of uh, Prussia and um, Tannytown, Maryland, uh, McAllister, through Hanover, right? Hanover is also a German name. Through Peter Littletown. So this is, you know, Peter of uh, German descent. Uh, and then they crossed the Susquehanna and eventually arrived in Lancaster. Um, he noted along the way that there were lots of Germans in many of the towns he went through. They actually stayed with some of them. Um, unfortunately, he got to Lancaster and he missed Lieutenant Mueller by four days because he was off trying to pay another group of prisoners somewhere else. And um, so he started back to Dumfries on, on the 10th of February and he traveled with an American captain named Archibald Arms and two others. And they eventually arrived in Dumfries uh, February 13th. And uh, um, as one one of the documents that the T, or Lisa lent me for for this was this evidence where Lieutenant Mueller actually visited Dumfries and paid the prisoners in June uh, June 21st through the 24th. He stayed with them for three days. So this was a single sentence, and from that single sentence that, that Lisa gave us, we were able to expand the whole thing into a you know a 50 page uh, paper and publish it three times. So kind of kind of great stuff, you know. Um, so what was life like in Dumfries? Um, as you may remember, uh, Dumfries was uh, a shipping town and, and uh, you know, the merchants, uh, the farmers, the plantation owners would bring their, their goods there to Dumfries. Um, they'd load them up on the ships there on the Quantico Creek and the creek had access to the Potomac and, and then they would, you know, go down the Potomac River and, and uh, ship these goods off to England eventually or, or the Caribbean. Um, wherever and these this, this this trade was run by scotsmen you know the scottish merchants were in there but when the war broke out these scots were like they left they they headed out of town so their houses were abandoned and this is where the the, the uh, prisoners stayed they, they occupied these abandoned homes um and lieutenant Wiederhold himself moved several times um and and as i said he took up drawing and he sold his, his paintings to, to make a little money and uh, he recorded all his experiences about social life. 
So here, here's one of the maps that he drew. And um, I've been uh, attempting to compare this map with you know, a modern Google map. And what's interesting is that these roads still exist, right? Um, this, if you can see my mouse uh, over here on the far right, this is the old stagecoach road. And you know, today you know that the, the Boys and Girls Club is located like right about here where my mouse is. And this is, of course, Jefferson Davis Highway. Uh, and as you come down here and get, you know, get into Dumfries, um, whoop, sorry about that. Okay, how do I go back to my previous there? It is. Uh, <clears throat> you can see that, that some of these buildings still exist if you go up this this path, you know, the Weems Platz uh, Museum is up in here. Um, here's the cemetery uh, that was uh, basically under I-95 right now. Um, and the, the newer cemetery, uh, the Dumfrey Cemetery is over here. So these, there's, there's a lot of things you can pick out here. But this is the Quantico Creek. And as you know, it, it, it was certainly a lot wider then uh, than it is now. And um, and that's how the, the goods, you see the warehouses down along the river. That's where they would store the, the things before the, uh, the ships would come in and, and be able to pick them up. So that is the Port of Dumfries, so to speak, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, there was one other interesting adventure that I did was um, they mentioned on a map uh, by historic Prince William, um, hey, uh, Hessian POW camp, uh, 1777 question mark and um you know so i said well i ought to be able to find that right and and i think i did um because that's us one and you can see a very distinct bend in the river um and uh, you know the iron works i was able to kind of see that when i got down by the creek you know kind of see where that was another flat piece of ground um and uh, and so i went down there to look for it and um Lo and behold, um, so this is, you know, Powell's Creek is on the left of the photo there, and it bends around there. That was the bend that, that I showed you on the other map. And then you can see uh, Highway 1 out there, US 1 is, is over there. That's the, the bridge that goes across, um, you know, Highway 1. And uh, this is a pretty flat piece of ground, more than likely a, a good place to put a little, a little shack where uh, there were four officers that were put there for four days uh, from march 7th to, to march 11th and um, so maybe if we dig up some money we can go out here and do a archaeological dig and see if we can find any evidence of a of a building here um, under under this flat piece of ground um <laughs> Wiederholt also mentions um that there were some rather large trees and large leaves. And he said, you know, there, there, there's leaves that are the size of a quattro piece of paper. So I looked up what a, what a quattro piece of paper is, and that's basically today, modern terms, that's an eight and a half by 11. And so um, I found this big, he said that these leaves are huge. So I found this leaf uh, here in Woodbridge. And uh, as you can see, it's almost as big as a quattro piece of paper. Um, so uh, these leaves, you know, still exist in, uh, in 2020 here in beautiful Dumfries. Uh, another interesting mention that, that Wiederhold does is uh, he says there was these all these little small green frogs. You know, he mentions this on, on page 90. And uh, so I decided that um, I would go find one of these green frogs because I have them climbing all over my, my back deck. And this, this little character right here, you can see, He's on the light warming up and he's looking up at my American flag. So um, I, he, he truly is an American and uh, Andreas Wiederholt was able to um, figure out that the, 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 the small green flag flat frogs are, are something different than anything they had in Germany. Um, and there you go. Um, <clears throat> so how did this all come to an end? Um, British General Howe landed about 15,000 troops at the head of the Elk. In Maryland. And uh, that all of a sudden made Dumfries not very secure. And so uh, the Hessians moved in September of 1777, the prisoners, and they were moved out to uh, Winchester. Haven't figured out yet how, how they got there. Uh, did they march? You know, were they 
where they transported. Um, so this is something I want to work with uh, uh, some folks out, out in the western part of the state to see if they, they have any uh, thing in their archives about these, these prisoners and, and how they arrived. Um, they didn't stay too long in uh, didn't stay too long in Winchester. Um, they ended up in Fredericksburg, and then over the course of time, uh, there was an exchange in March of '78, April of '78, May of '78, and then all the, these prisoners in Dumfries were exchanged for for other officers. And what's interesting, my own third great grandfather was also exchanged in 1778 out of Lancaster, and most of them all ended up in New York because um, the British were still occupying New York. And um, so that's another, another piece of the story that, uh, that I want to be able to put together and, and, and figure that out. And then after the war, we know that, that some of them uh, you know, certainly went back to Europe. Uh, some actually died you know, in, in either disease or otherwise here in America or on the ship back, right? Pretty dangerous adventure in those days. Uh, and we know of one that stayed behind here in America. And uh, <clears throat> that uh, the, the one that stayed behind is, is as I said, is profiled in, already been profiled by, by JSHA. So what we want to do is we're going to review all of that information and uh, can we update it at all? For instance, he is buried in Dumfries and, and I need to figure out uh, if we can find that grave. Uh, we do know he didn't get married. And uh, so, um, so he, did, he left no one behind, right? Okay. Anyway, in, in summary, um, you know, I mentioned this before, there were 26 officers, 23 non-commissioned. Uh, there were 36 individuals that had an identified age. And, and so we averaged that out, uh, that's 27 and a half. So that makes sense, right? An officer probably would have been a bit older, right, than 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 the normal troop, and um, and you know the younger officers, you know, would skew that, right, a little bit. So that that's about right. You know, they were um, they had one colonel, one lieutenant colonel, and one major. So um, and they were a little older, but the oldest person was fifty five, and the youngest was eight. So one of these non officers was actually an eight year old. Um, son of, of one of the officers more than likely. And I uh, haven't figured it out exactly yet you know, all the details on him. This is kind of an interesting uh, profile to be done. And, and 14 of the soldiers had identified jobs. And so in other words, uh, we could tell that they, they had you know, skills like you know, making clothing or um, they were cooks or, or something like that that was identified. And that's generally, you know, uh, each officer would have like a servant and um, to help him with everything, right? Keep his clothes clean, you know, make his meals or, or coordinate with others about how they were going to eat. So it's kind of interesting that they had jobs like that. So in summary, uh, we, we, we felt like we did a pretty good job of uh, answering the questions we set out to answer. Uh, of course, there are some pending. Uh, I think we've added a significant uh, new piece of uh, information to for Prince William and, and historic Dumfries to use as we go forward towards the uh, 250th anniversary. Um, and, you know, we have a significant set of references if somebody else wants to you know, really dig into it. Um, I plan on donating a book to, uh, to Lisa to talk to her about that. So this would be the updated story. And, um, and again, you know, we have one officer that we're trying to look at, you know, Fuhrer, uh, he stayed in America and he's buried in Dumfries. And uh, so I, I still have uh, some fun things to do, right? Go to Winchester, uh, see what they have, and work with, uh, it's interesting, the, uh, the prisoners that were released at Frederick, Maryland ended up in Loudoun County. Uh, they decided to come to Virginia and make their way there. And uh, uh, so it's very interesting. The Hessians are pretty, pretty good subject uh, for Virginia, Virginians to consider. So uh, any, anyone have any questions? Um, let's see if I can get the chat up. Are there any questions in chat or anybody open the mic? Ross, I have a question if I may. 
Yes, sir. Uh, how, where did the pay come from? Uh, they were paid by the British, so did the, did the British get that pay to a central location that, that the Germans, the Hessians could pick it up and take it to the other prisoners? Uh, right. Uh, yeah, good question. So, yeah, a ship would, you know, ship would come in from, uh, from England with uh, the Hessian pay, and of course they had to get that money from, um, you know, from the subsidies, right? The, the, the prince, the prince is in in Hesse would say, okay, we know we have this many troops in America, so here's the amount of money that needs to, to go to America, um, so that they would have an accounting of that. So the British would bring the money, so the British quartermaster corps would would uh, get with the with the Hessian quartermaster and say, okay, here here's you know we know these people are in Lancaster, we know you know these amount in Lancaster, this amount in Dumfries, you know here here's the money to go pay them. And so the Americans would, um, uh, when they crossed over the lines, the Americans would provide a, a small guard to help. So this money wasn't stolen, right? And, and uh, they would move with them. Uh, and it was interesting because, you know, the Pennsylvania boys weren't coming to Maryland. So there had to be a Maryland, you know, set of soldiers to take them through Maryland. And then the same thing in Virginia. Not, not, we're Maryland, we can't go in Virginia, right? And so another set of, troops would come and uh, and that's how that worked uh, the quartermaster had a wagon because he was also bringing clothing right uh he was you know socks were a big thing right they would wear out their socks um and uh so uh, their clothing would be replaced their, their their socks would be replaced um and and you know they didn't need the other things right musket you know musket box or any of that stuff right uh, so um so they got clothing and and um and the pay, and that's how it worked. And then the and Mueller would keep an accounting of this, the quartermaster Mueller. And, uh, you know, we have his, some of his records and, and uh, we try and figure out, you know, who he paid and who he didn't pay. So that's kind of how sir. it worked. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting, Ross, thank you. Yes, sir. Ross, if someone wanted to contact you to purchase um, one of the journals or get in touch with you, uh, what would be the best contact? Uh, could you maybe put up an email or something like that in our chat box? Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. And, and of course, y'all can contact Lisa and she can get a hold of me. Definitely. Um, <laughs> I'll type in um, our info as well, our contact information too. Yeah. Do I have to stop sharing this? I can't. Oh, let me see if I can get this up there. I'm trying to get the thing full screen to go to chat. Here we go. So I have an easy email to remember. I am a Pennsylvania Hessian. <laughs> so there you go. PA Hessian at gmail.com. Um. Ross, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, I'm Nancy West. Uh, my, my husband and I just recently moved from Dumfries. We lived on Cameron Street for uh, about 60 years, right up from the museum. We are founding members of Historic Dumfries, but we now live at Westminster uh, at Lake Ridge, which is a retirement, independent living retirement community. And I have found this fascinating, and I'm so glad that I remembered to tune in in time. We often have programs like this. We have two dedicated uh, TV channels here, and we also uh, often have programs of this nature. I think people here would be very interested in seeing your presentation. Uh, would you be uh, willing to maybe make a presentation just like we had this morning? Uh, yeah. Yes. If and, I can and, make those arrangements. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I uh, would love to come over there. I I um I did a little talk at my my in laws uh, retirement community in Lancaster one time. And that that was kind of fun. And uh, but yeah, no. By all means, um, uh, glad to come by. You know. So several of my church members are Westminster residents and. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. So you live in the area, in the uh, Woodbridge area? Yeah, I, li I live in Woodbridge. Yep, on Lisbania Peninsula. 
because we also have uh, a room called the Potomac Room where uh, it could be shown on screens. You could be here in person. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, absolutely. It, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm heading to Fairfax today. I have another talk. Well, I'd have to make arrangements. <laughs> With another it might, subject. It might be uh, several weeks down the road uh, because I'd have to make arrangements with the uh, uh, staff here. Uh, but I'll, I'll get, uh, Lisa, I'll be in touch with you and get information. And, and we hopefully maybe we could make that happen. I think this has been wonderful. And I was interested because my, my mother's family came from Germany. Um, and their name is spelled, my mother's maiden name was W-E-I-N-R-I-C-H. And we always pronounced it Weinrich. But I don't think that's the way it would be pronounced in German. Mm. Uh, but there's also a Weinrich chocolate company in, in uh, Germany. And when my nephew was stationed there in the army, uh, my sister, his mother, and my mother uh, went to Germany and they found the chocolate factory because uh, it, this had been traced back to uh, my mother's family. So that was kind of an interesting link there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and presenting. It's such a fascinating topic. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Lisa and I are, are uh, hopeful that we can actually meet in person sometime. Because I, I, we plan on bringing a reenactment unit down there to uh, parade around the grounds a little, yeah. you know, so they can so we can have some real Hessians and Humphreys. So uh, yes, Jim Park's just waiting. <laughs> yeah, 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 we're. Uh, it's great. It's flat ground, and we love that. <laughs> it's not hills. <laughs> yeah, I have. I have to go to training next Sunday. We have a big event in Maryland, and uh, I'm, I, I haven't been able to get out with them, you know. So, but uh, they, they want to catch me up, you know. I have to learn German again. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And if you want to follow up, just check the chat, and you can contact either me, and I'll I'll send you to Ross or contact him directly. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everyone has a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, thank, you. thank you very much. Thanks, Russ. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> thank you.